Lesson 1 for June 30 through to July 6, ready for teaching on July 7. You will be my witnesses. The introduction to this series of lessons, titled The Book of Acts, comes from Wilson Porosky. Dr. Wilson Porosky is a professor of New Testament interpretation at Brazil Adventist University, that's UNASP, in Engenheiro Cuiulo in Sao Paulo in Brazil. He holds a PhD degree in New Testament from Andrews University and performed postdoctoral studies at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. He now lectures in theology at Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. Dr. Porosky will read the introduction to this series of lessons. It's titled, The Victory of the Gospel. Welcome, Pastor Wilson Porosky. The Victory of the Gospel Many historians believe that the three most crucial decades in world history occurred when a small group of men, mostly Jews, under the power of the Holy Spirit, took the gospel to the world. The book of Acts is an account of those three crucial decades, which spanned from the resurrection of Jesus in A.D. 31 to the end of Paul's first Roman imprisonment in A.D. 62. The book must have been written shortly thereafter, for it stops the narrative at that point, though evidence exists is that Paul was released from that imprisonment and that he resumed his missionary endeavors, preaching and traveling, until he was arrested a few years later and then executed in Rome in A.D. 67. The book is silent about its author, but church tradition has always identified him as Luke, the beloved physician of Colossians 4.14 and traveling companion of Paul. Luke is also traditionally believed to be the author of our third gospel, no doubt the first book mentioned in Acts 1.1. Both Luke and Acts are twin volumes on the beginnings of Christianity, respectively its origin, Jesus' life and ministry, and expansion, the apostles' missionary endeavors. Together, They comprise about 27% of the New Testament, the largest contribution of a single author. Writing to the Colossians, Paul refers to Luke as a Gentile co-worker, someone who was not of the circumcision. Luke, then, is the only non-Jewish author of a New Testament book. This seems to explain one of his main themes, the universality of salvation. God has no favorites. The church is called to witness to all people, irrespective of their race, social class, or gender. A failure to do so, whether by prejudice or convenience, is a distortion of the gospel and contrary to the most basic truths of God's word. We are, before God, all the same, sinners in need of the redemption found in Christ Jesus. It is not by chance, then, that Luke's main hero is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, to whom almost two-thirds of the book of Acts is dedicated. Other important themes found in Acts include the sovereignty of God and His divine purpose, the exaltation of Jesus as Lord and Savior, and especially the role of the Spirit in empowering and guiding the church for its mission. In fact, The achievements of the early church were not the result of human wisdom or ability, though it pleased God to use someone like Paul to impact the world in a way that no other apostle did or perhaps was able to do. Acts deals with the formative period of the early church, in which there was considerable administrative and even theological growth. We can see this, for example, in the way the church dealt with questions concerning the time of Jesus' second coming, the status of the Gentiles, and the role of faith for salvation. What the early church was able to accomplish in such a short period of time, however, is a perpetual testimony of what God can do through those who humble their hearts in prayer, live beyond individual differences, and let themselves be used by the Spirit for God's honor and glory. 
Acts is the story of those called of God to start the work. What can we, who are called of God to finish it, learn from their story? Sabbath afternoon, June 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this whole new quarter that deals with the book of Acts, as we study it, as we delve into it and learn the history, as we learn of your leading and your guiding, as we learn of the strength and the spirit of those who were there and the almost impossible results that they obtained, through the functioning of your Holy Spirit. We pray that as we open your word, that we too may be inspired and that your Holy Spirit will guide us personally. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text is Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's read that again, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' mission on earth was finished. God would soon send the Holy Spirit, who, ratifying their efforts with many signs and wonders, would empower and lead the disciples on a mission that would reach the ends of the earth. Jesus could not stay with them forever in human flesh. Not only did his incarnation impose upon him a physical limitation in the extent of a worldwide mission, but his ascension and exaltation in heaven were necessary in order for the Spirit to come. Until Jesus' resurrection, however, the disciples did not clearly know these things. When they left everything to follow him, they believed that he was a political liberator who would one day drive the Romans out of the land, reinstate David's dynasty, and restore Israel to its past glory. It was not easy for them to think otherwise. This is the primary issue of Jesus' final instructions to the disciples in Acts chapter 1. The promise of the Spirit comes in this context. The chapter also describes Jesus' return to heaven and how the early church prepared itself for Pentecost. Sunday, July 1, the Restoration of Israel. There are two kinds of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, one that anticipates a kingly Messiah who would rule forever, as could be read in Psalm 89, 3 and 4, and in 35 to 37, and Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, and Ezekiel 37, verse 25, and Daniel 2, 44, Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and one that predicts that the Messiah would die for the sins of the people, as in Isaiah 52, right through to 53, and in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Such prophecies do not contradict each other. They just point to two consecutive phases of the Messiah's ministry. First, he would suffer and then become king, as Luke told his disciples in chapter 17 and in chapter 24. The problem with first century Jewish messianic expectation, however, was that it was one-sided. The hope of a kingly Messiah who would bring political deliverance obscured the notion of a Messiah who would suffer and die. At first, the disciples shared this hope of a kingly Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. 
and was sometimes caught bickering among themselves about who would sit on either side of him when he was enthroned. Despite Jesus' warnings about the fate that awaited him, they simply could not understand what he meant. So, when he died, they became confused and discouraged. In their own words, in Luke 24 verse 21, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Question, read Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. What does this question say about what they still didn't understand? In Acts chapter 1 verse 7, the next verse, how did Jesus answer them? Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. If Jesus' death represented a fatal blow to the disciples' hope, the resurrection revived it, raising their political expectations perhaps to an unprecedented level. It seemed natural to conceive of the resurrection as a strong indicator that the messianic kingdom would finally be established. In his reply to their question, however, Jesus gave no direct answer. He did not reject the premise behind the disciples' question of an imminent kingdom, but neither did he accept it. He left the issue unsettled, while he reminded them that the timing of God's actions belongs to God himself, and as such, it is inaccessible to humans. And so to finish today, according to Luke 24:25, what was the real problem of the disciples? Why is it easy to believe what we want to believe as opposed to what the Bible really teaches? How can we avoid that trap? And Luke 24:25, then he said to them, "O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken." Monday, July 2, The Disciples' Mission Question, read Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Instead of indulging in prophetic speculations, what were the disciples expected to do? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. There are four important elements in this passage concerning the disciples' mission. 1. The gift of the Spirit. The Spirit always had been active among God's people. According to the prophets, however, there would be a special endowment of the Spirit in the future. Acts 44 verse 3 says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And Joel 2 verses 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. As Jesus himself was anointed with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was already at work during the time of his ministry, but officially was not inaugurated until Christ's exaltation in heaven. As we read in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and to 21, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord. And John chapter 7 and verse 39. 
By this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. 2. The Role of Witness A witness is a first-hand account. The disciples were fully qualified to give such a witness, as we read in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Therefore, as these men, who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection, and Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And we'll compare that with First John chapter 1, verses 1 through to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And were commissioned to share with the world their unique experience with Jesus. 3. The Plan of the Mission the disciples were to witness first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth. It was a progressive plan. Jerusalem was the centre of Jewish religious life, the place where Jesus had been condemned and crucified. Judea and Samaria were neighbouring areas where Jesus also had ministered. The disciples, however, were not to limit themselves to this locale alone. The scope of their mission was worldwide. 4. The Orientation of the Mission In Old Testament times, it was the nations that should be attracted to God, not Israel, that should take God to the nations, as we'll see in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through to 5. And that reads, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. The few exceptions, for example Jonah, do not invalidate the general rule. Now, the strategy was different. Jerusalem was still the centre, but rather than staying and building roots there, the disciples were expected to move out to the uttermost ends of the earth. Question. Read Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 48. What was the core message that the disciples should preach? Luke 24, beginning at verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses to these things.
In the forty days he spent with the disciples after the resurrection, we read that in Acts 1-3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, Jesus must have explained much truth to them about the kingdom of God, even if there was still much they didn't understand, as their question in Acts 1 6 showed. And that reads, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They were familiar with the prophecies, but could now see them in a new light. A light shed from the cross and the empty tomb, as we read in Acts chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Tuesday, July 3. He will come again. Question. Read Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through to 11. How does Luke portray the ascension of Jesus? What is the significance that there were two angels speaking to them? And we'll also look at Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And Luke 19, sorry, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Luke's account of the ascension is rather brief. Jesus was with the disciples on the Mount of Olives, and while still blessing them, he was taken to heaven, as we read in Luke 24, verse 51. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. He was taken to heaven. The language, of course, is phenomenological. That is, the scene is portrayed as it looked to human eyes, not as it really was. Jesus was leaving the earth, and there is no other way to do so in a visible form than by going up. The ascension of Jesus was a supernatural act of God, one of many all through the Bible. This is implied by the way Luke describes it, with the passive epithe, he was taken up, in Acts 1.9. Though used only here in the New Testament, this verbal form is found several times in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, all of them describing actions of God, which suggest that God himself was the one who took Jesus up to heaven, as he was the one who raised him from the dead. We have texts to look up here, Acts chapter 2, verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And Romans 10 and verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. After Jesus already had been hidden by a cloud, Luke reports, 
only in Acts, the episode of the two figures dressed in white who stood beside the disciples. The description coincides with that of angels in their bright robes. In Acts chapter 10, verse 30, so Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And John chapter 20, and verse 12, And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They were to assure the disciples that Jesus would come back the same way he had gone up. And it is also only Acts that informs us that Jesus went up before their very eyes, as it said in Acts 1 verse 9. Thus, the visible ascension became the guarantee of the visible return, which also will happen in a cloud, though with power and great glory, as it says in Luke 21.27, no longer as a private event, as every eye will see him in Revelation 1.7, and he will not be alone, as we read in Luke 9 and verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's, and of the holy angels, and Second Thessalonians 1 verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The glory of the second coming will far exceed that of the ascension. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to keep the reality and promise of the second coming always before us? How should this great truth impact all areas of our life, such as finances, priorities and moral choices? Wednesday, July 4, Preparing for Pentecost In his reply in Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Jesus made no commitment with regard to time. Yet, the natural implication of his words was that right after the Spirit came and the disciples completed their mission, he would return. Let's look at Matthew 24:14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The angel's remark in Acts 1.11 also did not answer the question as to when the kingdom would come, but it could be understood as if it would not be long. This seems to explain why the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy, as it said in Luke 24.52. The promise of Jesus' second coming at an unspecified time, which should give them extra encouragement for their mission, was taken to mean that the end was close at hand. Further developments in Acts will demonstrate this idea. Question. Read Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Who else was in the upper room, and how did they prepare themselves for the coming of the Spirit? Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Having returned from the Mount of Olives, the disciples gathered in the upper guest room, in Latin canaculum, of a two-story private house in Jerusalem. Some women followers, as well as Jesus' mother and brothers, were there with the disciples. And we're going to look at some texts here. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, 
and the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their sustenance. And Luke chapter 23, verse 49 But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus." And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marvelling to himself at what had happened. Jesus' brothers, as in Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Were either younger sons of Joseph and Mary, or more likely sons of Joseph's first marriage, in which case Joseph would be widowed when he took Mary for his wife. Matthew 1 and verse 25. And did not know her till she had brought forth her first son, and he called his name Jesus. And Luke 2 verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Their presence among the disciples came as a surprise, as they had always been rather sceptical towards Jesus. Mark 3.21 reads, But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And John 7 verse 5, For even his brothers did not believe him. Yet the resurrection and Jesus' special appearances to James seem to have made all the difference. 1 Corinthians 15.7 reads, After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Later on, James apparently would even replace Peter in the leadership of the Christian community, as we read in Acts 12.17, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. And Acts 15.13, And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, Listen to me. And Acts 21, verse 18. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. And verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Acts 1 verse 14 reads, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Constantly in prayer and constantly in the temple praising God, as we read in Luke 24.53, they all were no doubt involved in a time of confession, repentance, and the putting away of sin. 
even if in their minds the coming of the Spirit would immediately lead to Jesus' return, their spiritual attitude was in full harmony with what was about to happen, as the Holy Spirit comes in response to prayer. In our daily choices, to finish today, what are ways we help prepare the way for the work of the Spirit in our lives? Thursday, July 5, the Twelfth Apostle. The first administrative action of the early Christian community, which numbered about 120 believers, Acts 1.15 tells us that, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120, was to choose a successor to Judas. Question. Read Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. What qualification was the successor to Judas expected to have? Why would these be important? Acts chapter 1 verse 21 Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus was in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. The need was for a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Acts 4.33 talks about that. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. This is crucial, because time and again the resurrection is viewed as powerful evidence for the Messiahship of Jesus and the truth of the whole Christian faith. The choice, however, was to be made from among those who had accompanied the apostles throughout Jesus' ministry. Paul would later insist that, despite not having been with the earthly Jesus, he was nevertheless entitled to the apostolic office because his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus qualified him to bear witness to his resurrection, as we read in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Though admitting to be as one untimely born in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8, Paul refused to consider himself less qualified than the other apostles, as we read in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 2. If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 to 9. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. Only the twelve and Paul, then, were apostles in the technical authoritative sense. Acts one twenty five and 26, to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Yet, in its basic general sense, as envoys or messengers, the term also could be used for other gospel workers, as we read in Acts 14, verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, 
and part with the apostles. And verse 14, But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out. And Galatians 1.19, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Question. Read Acts chapter 1, verses 23 to 26. How was Matthias chosen? And they proposed too, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The method they used to choose Matthias may seem strange. But the casting of lots was a long-established way of making decisions. For example, in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5 to 10, And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats of a sin, as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord, to make atonement upon it, and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness." And Numbers 26, verse 55. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall inherit according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. In addition, the choice was between two previously recognized candidates of equal qualifications, not a step into the unknown. The believers also prayed to God, believing that the result would reflect his will. Uh, and we're going to compare this with Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. There is no evidence that the decision was ever challenged. After Pentecost, the casting of lots became no longer necessary due to the direct guidance of the Spirit, as we read in Acts 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? And Acts 11, verses 15 to 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon me, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If, therefore, God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Acts 13 verse 2 reads, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And Acts 16, verses 6 through to 9. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So, to finish today, if someone were to come to you and ask, How can I know what God's will is for my life? What would you answer, and why? <laughs> Friday, July 6. 
from the book The Message of Acts, The Spirit, The Church and the World by John R. W. Stott, published in 1990, page 44, we read, The whole interim period between Pentecost and the Parousia, the second coming, however long or short, is to be filled with the worldwide mission of the Church in the power of the Spirit. Christ's followers were both to announce what he had achieved at his first coming and to summon people to repent and believe in preparation for his second coming. They were to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, as it says in Acts 1.8, and to the very end of the age. We have no liberty to stop until both ends have been reached. End of quote. And Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 822. The Saviour's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers in Christ to the end of time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Acts 1 verse 7 recalls Mark 13.32 Concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Ellen White says in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 188, There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time, either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. She adds in uh, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, September 12, 1893, Anyone who shall start up to proclaim a message to announce the hour, day or year of Christ's appearing has taken up a yoke and is proclaiming a message that the Lord has never given him. End of quote. What is the relevance of such statements for us today? 2. Someone once said, God needs witnesses more than lawyers. What do you think of this statement? 3. What was the role of prayer in the early church? Is it a coincidence that at almost every decisive moment in its life we find a reference to prayer, as in Acts chapter 1 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 13? What is the role of prayer in our lives? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled I Want to Kill People and it's by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Li Feng Yan's cell phone rang sharply. Mum, I am miserable, said the voice on the other end. It was Feng Yan's daughter-in-law, Yang Yang. She was crying hysterically. My life is so hard, I don't know what to do. Worried, Feng Yan brought Yang Yang to her home, and the two began to talk. Yang Yan spoke of hearing voices that commanded her to act violently. I want to beat people. I want to kill people, Yang Yang said. Hide your knives. If I just see a knife, I will kill someone. Feng Yang called her pastor at the Tokyo Chinese Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Yu Chan Fu was leading the evening prayer meeting, but he came to her home and prayed and read the Bible with Yang Yang. Yang Yang liked the prayers and the Bible, and she began to read the Bible regularly as she stayed with her mother-in-law for a while. She also read books by Ellen G. White. The voices ceased, and she started to smile. She started to attend Sabbath services at the Tokyo Chinese Church. Yang Yang's husband was amazed at the change in his wife. He started going to church with her and his mother. A year later, they were baptized. Then Yang Yang's own mother fell ill, and the doctors didn't know what to do. Yang Yang asked church members to pray. She told her mother to throw away the family's Buddhist idol and trust God instead. 
As the church members prayed, her mother made a miraculous recovery. Before the prayers, her mother did not believe in Jesus, Feng Yan said, but after the prayers, she believes in God. The mother got rid of the idol, and several months later, she and her husband were baptised. And that's not all. Yang Yang and Feng Yang have been telling relatives back in China about God, and several have started attending Adventist churches there. Feng Yang, 53, credits God and the Tokyo Chinese Church for the transformation of her family. Every Sabbath we have a place to worship, she said. Eight people have been baptised into the Tokyo Chinese Church because of her influence. The Tokyo Chinese Church, the only Chinese-speaking Adventist church in Japan, opened with about five members in 2012 through the support of a 13th Sabbath offering. Today, the church is overflowing with 50 members and is planning to double the size of its sanctuary. Pray for us as we grow, Pastor Yu said. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.